book of Joel is not really that well known. If you've been a believer for a while, there's at least one place hopefully you know Joel from. It's from when Peter quotes it in Acts chapter 2. That's the type of message this book has. It's to help the Christian to continually be repenting to restore the relationship that they have with God, to keep it clean, to constantly have a lifestyle that is one of humility and, and, and honesty before your God. If you're not a Christian, you're not a believer, this book is very important for you as well because the day of the Lord means the one true God of the universe does indeed judge both temporally things in this life and eternally permanent. And everyone has business with Yahweh. And so the day of the Lord is something that we should consider. In a way, when you die, that's the day of the Lord. When you face judgment, that's a day of the Lord, wherein he acts according to his righteousness, decisively, comprehensively. So I pray that as we read some of these strange things about locusts, we're going to be talking about locusts this morning. They're featured prominently in chapter 1, so we're going to be talking about locusts. In fact, the sermon's called The Day of the Locusts. But I encourage you to stick with it because this message is from God, by the mouth of the prophet Joel, to us. And I pray that we listen and tell others, just like the book instructs. Joel, chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. The fields are destroyed. The grounds mourn because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine dries up. The fig tree languishes. Pomegranate, palm, and apple. All the trees of the field are dried up and gladness dries up for the children of man. Put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. Is not the food cut off beyond our, before our eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God? The sea shrivels under the clods, the storehouses are desolate, the granaries are torn down because the grain has dried up. How the beasts groan, the herds of cattle are perplexed because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. To you, O Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. 
and flame has burned all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you, because the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Joel 1.1 1, 1 says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. The word of the Lord. So, when we look at Scripture, our conviction, we believe it is true, is that this is the word of the one true and living God. And He has spoken, He has acted in history, and He's kept a record of some of this. Joel is an example. So this is the word of Yahweh, the word of I am, the word of the one true God. It's for us. That's why we stop and say, today we're looking at the book of Joel. We preach through a book because we believe it is God's word to us. Even, no matter what the message is, it's God's word to us. And so you may say, this is what we're going to be learning about. This sounds horrible. It sounds like a lament. It is a lament. It is horrible. That's what Joel 1 is about. It is the word of the Lord, though, for us. And so we stop, and that's why we go through these books. Joel, the second book uh, found in the collection called the Minor Prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, it goes on. That's why we look at these sort of lesser-known places, because we believe it is the word of God. And so there's something for us here. Now, we don't have much biographical information about Joel. If you look, Joel 1, 1, B, that's really about it. So we know his name in Hebrew would be something like Yoel. That's how you would say it. They don't have a J sound, really. Yoel ben Pethuel. Yoel, son of Pethuel. We know his name must be the result, it seems, of parents who were faithful to the covenant with God. This is in a day when lots of Israelites who were God's people were turning their back on Yahweh, ignoring him. It seems Joel's parents named him specifically to say there is one true God. His name is Yahweh because his name means Yahweh is God. That's what the name is. Very simple statement of monotheistic faith. Joel's name. Now, we really don't know when this book was written. With a lot of the prophets, if you read Isaiah, it's essential to know in general when the book was written or a lot of stuff will not compute because of the names and the different things going on. With Joel, it's not so much as key. So that's okay. So I'm not going to discuss all the different dates that it could be. It could be around the 8th century BC. Some people think as late as 500 years before Christ. I think probably somewhere around 800 years before Christ is right. But the thing is, it is a timeless message. And so we're not going to get hung up on exactly when it was written. We know it was written in the era of when there was a lot of invasion into Israel and back and forth. We know the temple was around because he mentioned the temple, but we don't know exactly the date. We do know he operated in the environs of Jerusalem, though, by some of the things he says. So we have a little bit of information about him. We know he's a prophet. We know he's speaking to the southern kingdom, Judah, and that's it. And immediately after it says, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, he goes right into what he has to say about the day of the Lord. And the first thing is found in verse 2. Hear this, you elders, give ear, all inhabitants of the land. So he mentions the elders who may be older people, they may be leaders, they may be sort of both. He mentions that, but then he says everybody, all the inhabitants of the land. This is everybody. Has such a thing happened in your day or in the days of your fathers? The idea is this is a catastrophic event. Sometimes we use the phrase time immemorial to say something like that has never happened or a day that will live on in infamy. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, listen up to this message that I'm going to give that explains, it exegetes the current events happening to us. Verse 3, 
Tell your children of it. And let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. So this is interesting because this is about judgment. Joel is saying, tell your children about God's judgment. So not just about all the different colors of animals on Noah's Ark. Although, have you ever thought about Noah's Ark? You know, it's one of the famous things we teach kids. It's kind of a stereotypical thing, you know, giraffes on the kids' room and all that. It's about judgment. Noah's, that's what's going on there. We should be telling our kids about the judgment of God. Not just nice and happy, one-dimensional understanding of God that's safe. We should tell them about the true God of the universe who no man can control. That way, they have a big picture of the one true God. And he's saying, tell your children. Oh, well, that's, a, that's a scary part of the Bible. I don't want to read that. Let's just read over here. Tell your children. And by the way, sir, your Sunday school teachers here or wherever you go, they can help. But who's supposed to be telling the children about God's judgment? This would be the fathers, this would be the parents. And let them tell, and let them tell, and let them tell. Verse 4. And here's what they're to tell about the day of the locust. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust is eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust is eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust is eaten. Basically, lots and lots of locusts ate everything. That's the short version of this. Now, for us, we're going to go through this and we're going to see that all the fruit is gone, the grounds, everything is just destroyed. It's hard for us to wrap our head around that. It seems abstract, but that's very real. Locusts actually are still a problem in this modern era. And this is not a very good analogy, but try to think of something like this. You go to buy some food tomorrow from the store. You go to Safeway and it's closed. You go to Sprouts and it's closed. You go to Trader Joe's and it's closed. You go to, if you're in the Midwest, you go to Kroger and it's closed. Everywhere you go, it's closed. There's no place to get food. That's what's going on. They see these locusts come in and immediately everything changes. You know, we can think of markets crashing and literally, can a market crash and just mess up everything within a day? Yes. That's the day of the locust here. And we have some information about these locust plagues from the ancient world. Augustine mentions them in his writings. King Sargon II, uh, an, an ancient king, mentions them. We have them all throughout Scripture. Amos mentions them and says they are given to Israel to bring them to repentance. Uh, we have actually first-hand accounts of these. National Geographic, there's a really, uh, it's archived online, you can see it, an article from 1915 called Jerusalem's Locust Plague. And one of the eyewitnesses, listen to this description of locusts, of what he says. In Jerusalem, attention was drawn to them by the sudden darkening of the bright sunshine. So have you ever wondered, you know, the sermon series called The Day, but everything's black? The Day of the Lord is actually dark. The locusts seem to even have darkened the sun. They swarm so much. And then by the veritable, this is gross, and then by the veritable shower of, the, of their excretions, which fell thick and fast, the clouds of them would be so dense so as to appear quite black. Now they're kind of like grasshoppers, except bigger and grosser. <laughs> you ever be in the car in the summer and a bee sneaks in? Some of us had the tendency to jump out real quick and start swatting and screaming and, and running and all that. One little bug, even a fly sometimes, right? This, or a little teeny spider. I sit down beside her. A little teeny bug. The most we know about a bunch of bugs is when we see them all dead on our windshield. Imagine a whole bunch of those three inch things. Now, usually grasshoppers are solitary, but certain conditions can happen in the environment where they swarm. There's a whole science about chemicals they excrete and all this, or how they start to gather up. But they, they mobilize into these thick, mobile, ravenous swarms. Let me tell you a little bit about them. 
A desert locust swarm can be 460 square miles in size and pack between 40 and 80 million locusts into less than half a square mile. They can be immense size and area, these swarms. 2,000 square miles of locusts was recorded around the Red Sea in 1881. Real tight density, 120 million locusts per square mile sometimes. One swarm can have up to 10 billion insects. And these guys can travel. They can cover great distances. They've been seen 1,200 miles out to sea. That means that far out of land. Uh, in 1954, a swarm flew from Northwest Africa to Great Britain. In 1988, another made the lengthy trek from West Africa to the Caribbean. A female grasshopper, which lays her eggs in June, may have, listen to this, so some of you who think we have too many kids, may have 18 million living descendants by October. Females can lay between 80 and 858 eggs, and they can do this several times, three to five times per month during their lifespan. They eat an average swarm, uh, like a well, one square, square kilometer a swarm of these things, will eat the, uh, the equivalent to what 35,000 people would eat. Each locust basically eats its weight in plants per day. So a swarm of some of the size we've been talking about could eat 423 million pounds of plants every day. Now, you may wonder, well, what, why don't we have these locust swarms? Well, in lots of the world, they still do. For example, in 88, in Chad, African country, there was a civil war, so they weren't able to do the preemptive measures, which we now do against locust swarms. And uh, it, it, it was able to basically land. And once they've landed and formed and swarmed, it's, it's very difficult to stop them. Let me show you some, some pictures briefly to give you an idea of this. I think is from Libya, uh, this picture. I think these are called canary locusts, I think. I'm not an entomologist, so don't quote me on this. But there's some really scary pictures of these things online. I mean, how would you even function? Even if, even if they didn't eat all the plants, it's really gross. There's a boy in Mexico City. He's, he's going to fight the good fight with his broom there. He's taking care of it. I thought that was a pretty awesome picture. He's, he's doing his best. This is a before and after shot. The thing is, it can get even worse than this. They can strip the bark, and Joel mentions how it's laid bare. It's just white. That's all that's left. So when we talk about this, this is a serious thing. In fact, this is a problem in America for a long time, especially for the Midwestern farmers. What we do now is we have special technology that can monitor them. We see them start to form, and we go up and basically do dog fights. We spray some pesticides and kill them while they're forming in the air. That's sort of how it goes. But these are still a very real problem. I mean, just look up online, locust plague, and you'll see it's not just from back in the day, it's all over. So this is a serious thing, and imagine being in Judah when this happens. What should they do? Why did this happen? First of all, this shows us God is in control. Before I go any further, let me make sure that I bring this out. God is sovereign. He is in control of the weather, of the insects, of it all. It's, Joel's not like, God tried to stop it, but he couldn't. He allowed it to happen. Joel is saying this is from God. Now, we don't have prophets around today in this way to say, oh, this tornado was from God. This is for this reason. I don't think we should be in that business. But we should take those things seriously and say, God is in control. Now, see, that... That, that's a more serious theology because you have to start thinking, God's in control of locust plagues, he's in control of tornadoes, he's in... That's the God of the Bible. He's not like, oh, look, locust swarm, didn't know that, I didn't get to monitor that, didn't... He knows, he directs, he guides, he ordains. And watch what he says now through the mouth of Joel to the populace as a result of the day of the locust. There's going to be a whole bunch of commands in here Let's look at some of them. First off, he specifically calls out the drunkard and what he calls the drinkers of wine. Look at verse 5. Awake, you drunkards. If you see my alley, you know that people, when they get really drunk, they're very difficult to wake up. They sleep. And weep and wail. And the weeping and wailing command to these folks doesn't seem to be, oh, because you should re return to the Lord right now. It seems almost like it's like, 
Weep and wail because your party is over. You won't have any more of this. You drinkers of wine because of the sweet wine for it is cut off from your mouth. Now, this is the only specific sin Joel calls out. If you read Isaiah, he's talking about idolatry. Hosea is talking about uh, sexual immorality, all kinds of things. Joel doesn't really tell us exactly what is happening as far as the sin that's being judged. He does mention this. Now, the Bible does not take some kind of stance against people drinking alcohol. That's not what this is saying. In fact, Joel doesn't go into some tirade against alcohol, does he? In fact, later on in this very book of Joel, he says, when everything is restored, your wine vats will be overflowing. It's a sign of abundance for God's people. Wine, it's, it's a good thing. It's a sign of prosperity for God's people. But not self-indulgence, not overconsumption. Awake, you drunkards. And perhaps this charge to those people is not just meant for the town drunk. It's a symbolic of this larger spiritual state of affairs of them. What do I mean? Sin is like being drunk. Your senses are dulled and deceived. You're sluggish. You're not who you're supposed to be. They dull the conscience being drunk. It messes with your judgment like sin. It makes you complacent. It is almost certain, and I don't say this to point fingers, that if you know someone who's a Christian who struggles in, in a serious way with drunkenness, it is almost a guarantee the spiritual life is complacent. You can almost always put the two together. A complacent, lackadaisical, self-indulgent lifestyle. It's not just the drunkenness that's a problem. It's a larger issue. And maybe not everyone in the nation is a drunkard, but they certainly are dull to the commands of the Lord. And he's saying, wake up. You know, ask, I, I, you know, the person who lives for the drink, it's like they don't really a lot of times know the state of economy. They, they just, they don't really know what's going on. They just know if they got their stuff or not. But here Yahweh is saying, the one thing you live for that I gave you to be a good thing, I'm taking it away so you will take notice. So for us, the things you live for, when God acts in judgment, he will take away so you will take notice. Not just the drunkenness, the alcohol, whatever it is. God will take it away so you will awake, weep, and wail. What about those drinkers of wine? That may not be folks who are alcoholics. It may just be the sort of self-indulgent. Because if you look from what we know in Israel about this time, in the north, we have a lot of uh, receipts we've dig, dug up through archaeology. And a lot of these receipts for all kinds of things, but we can gather that the north, now this is for the south, but we, it seems the north was relatively prosperous. And here's what's interesting, listen to this. A lot of the names of the people on the receipts had contracted names that had the word Baal in them. Just like Joel's name has God's name, the covenant God in it, a lot of times people would name their kids in relation to their favorite deity. So Baal, which is a competitor, false deity with Yahweh, a lot of them had that. So this kind of self-indulgent lifestyle went hand in hand with idolatry. Hosea in 12, 5, and 6 specifically talks about this going together, the book right before Joel. And he talks about new wine, which takes away the understanding. And the idea is that it's sudden. Look at verse 5. It's like, Right when the person's about to get a drink, oh, the sweet, <sighs> snatched away, even out of their mouth. It is sudden. You may think, oh, I'll be ready for the coming crisis, or that I can see it on the horizon. I'm smarter than ever. I know how to kind of spot it. God is saying, this will be so sudden, you will have no time to react. It's here and it's gone instantly. How did this happen? Verse 6, a nation has come up against my land. This locust are referred to a nation which later on in the book we'll see, Joel uses the idea of a plague of locusts to kind of sound like an army. So the locusts point to a future invasion of a real army. Joel continues to give commands to, uh, to the drunkard and, and the drinker, but the commands are also for the farmer, the worker. If you look at verse 11, it says, be ashamed, old tillers of the soil. 
Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. So this is for the average person kind of trying to do their thing. Be ashamed is the command they're given. It's the idea of they can't do what they're supposed to do. It's the idea of they, um, where something should be, now there's a void creating shame. I mean, if you've ever seen old movies with New York and you see those two big tall towers there, and then now you s imagine they're not there. There's voids in essence. There's a little park and all that, but uh, an empty spot. That's a, we recognize that as a tragedy. That was there. It's not there. To the farmers, the tillers of the ground, the vine dressers, that's sort of what's being said. Be ashamed. This is not a good thing. This is not something to take lightly. This is a big deal. This is a problem. But the most commands are actually given to the spiritual leadership of Judah, to the priest. To the priest. Watch all these commands in verse 13. This is almost like a how-to manual of how to repent. Put on sackcloth and lament. The priests weren't supposed to wear sackcloth. They had a whole kind of ornate garb if you study the Old Testament laws. Sackcloth, though, would be made out of goat's, goat's skin or fur or something like that and would be kind of rough to the skin. It's a sign of mourning. It's a sign of walking in humility. The priests are commanded, put on sackcloth and lament. This is a tragedy. This is something to be distraught about. Oh, priests! Wail, O oh ministers of the altar. Wail. How hard is this? This isn't just a tear. This is vocal, sobbing, weeping, crying, wailing. It's hard to do. We're prideful. Our culture doesn't encourage you doing this kind of thing in public. Wail? The spiritual leadership? Wail? God help us to have hearts that are willing to wail in repentance. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth. Verse 13, the last part. Stay up all night doing this. Don't sleep. This is urgent, that the repentance that God commands of us in our life is urgent. It's not tomorrow, whether you're a believer or unbeliever, it's urgent, because who knows when the day of the Lord comes. It is an essential thing to do now, and especially to the spiritual leadership. There are models, but if you look, the drunkards are mentioned, the average workers are mentioned, spiritual leadership is mentioned, everyone. This is communal repentance. And that's the other thing is, you notice it's done in community. Watch these next verses here. Verse 14, consecrate a fast. Fasting is basically not eating, to deal with spiritual things. Call a solemn assembly. Let's get together. Let's pray about this. Let's fast together. We need to talk about this. We need to repent in harmony. Gather the elders. That's the leadership. That's the more experience. And all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord, your God, and cry out to the Lord. There's an urgency to this. There's a, a command even to do it in community. Do you guys see that? It's an assembly. It's everybody. Repentance. But how do you, you can't work this up. What do we do? Pray to God that He would give you a heart that desires to be repentant. Repentance, what is that? Turning from sin, turning to God. Turning away from everything else as your idol as your number one to Jesus as your number one. Away from that to this. A permanent turning. Repentance. God have a mercy on us that we would have hearts that want to repent. To turn. Because why do we do those things? The sin and other things. Because we like them. How do we stop liking them? God has to give us a new disposition. It's not just adopting a new set of religious regulations. Well, I like this sermon. Maybe I should go to church more. and I'm a, That's how I'm going to repent. That's not repentance. It's not just adopting some new stuff, giving some new money, and all, increasing your attendance. That's all good. 
But it's a heart-rending exercise. That only comes via the supernatural act of the Holy Spirit on your heart. We must pray for that, to believer and unbeliever alike, that God would move, that we would have these kinds of hearts. Because we could see, this, is, this sounds ridiculous. I'm going to stay up all night. I'm going to dress humbly. I'm going to cry out loud around everyone else. I can't do that. That's for them. That's like for those really serious religious people. I'll just kind of do it in my room, and then I'll put on Facebook afterwards. I repented tonight. felt so good. This is a whole nother level that we are just not ready for, but God help us. And watch what Joel does. The last five verses. See, Joel cries to the Lord. He doesn't just say, and that's what you get. Stand back and say, it wasn't me. The church sometimes has had that attitude when we've seen the day of the Lord. It's this person's fault and that person's fault. In fact, these ancient Israelites, they tended to think that the day of the Lord meant God would just come and smash their enemies and set them up all grand. Joel was saying, that ain't all the day of the Lord is about. And in fact, this book is saying the day of the Lord is where judgment begins. But guess where it begins? With God's people. That's a challenge. The church has to deal with her stuff first. And Joel takes on that mantle of our attitude. He cries out. He prays. Listen to what he says. Alas for the day. The Hebrew word there, alas, it's a word that kind of sounds like, ah. Like it imitates the sound of the breath, the wind being knocked out of you. It's that kind of, ah, for the day. For the day of the Lord is near. Well, wait, I thought the locust just happened. The, I thought it just happened. No, it's going to get worse. That was just a little diminutive day of the Lord. That's just a little sneak peek. But it's a warning. God loves us. That's why he gives us the warning. Your enemy who hates you and just wants to smash on you, he don't tell you. He doesn't telegraph the signs of what he's about to do. Now he does. Because it's designed to make us repent for the day of the Lord is near and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. If there's any doubt in your mind that this judgment was from God himself, you should be settled. And Joel, this whole book has all these word plays. Joel is a really poetic prophet. They don't translate, but this one right here, destruction from the Almighty, it's something like this. The word for destruction is something like sod. And then the word for Almighty is something like Shaddai. So it's something like Sod from the Shaddai. Maybe a way we could sort of alliterate it to the way it would sound similar in English would be something like a shattering from Shaddai. That's from a commentary I read. I didn't make that up. A shattering from Shaddai. That's Patterson, not me. But I like that. A shattering from Shaddai. God's hand. See, that is a challenge of our conceptions about ourselves about God, about the, what, what He wouldn't do, what He would do, who He is. And that should change us. When things happen, we don't want to be like Job's three friends and just say, anything bad happens means you're sinning. So, for example, there's a church, not in America, all over the world, that's persecuted. Is it because they're sinning? So we don't just interpret it that way. This kingdom up to this point was actually really prosperous. Lots of wine, everything was going great. So prosperity is not necessarily a sign of God's favor either, all the time. But every event should be a time for us to stop and take note and say, okay, a superficial theology won't be able to handle the shattering from Shaddai in your life. That happened last year, that'll happen this year, you individually, us collectively. It, a, a superficial theology won't be able to do it. You won't start, you'll start to not like that God because you thought God was this way. He's really this way. This happens. You can't interpret it in light of your God you got over here. And so you either turn away or you realize God is different than I thought. Help me interpret this now. A shattering from Shaddai. Verse 16. Is not the food cut off before our eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God? Earlier it's mentioned that there wasn't even enough food and wine to go around to do the food, the, the grain and the wine offerings. There was daily 
grain and wine offerings that were instructed by Yahweh in Leviticus for the people to give. And they were a, a sign of continual upkeeping of the covenant and fellowship and intimacy with Yahweh. They didn't even have enough to do that. The priests are wailing and mourning because they were allowed to eat some of that. Now they don't have it. They can't even have the, the continued sacrifices. It's like everything is taken away. The seed shrivels under the clods. The storehouses are desolate. The granaries are torn down because the grain is dried up. How the beasts groan. That's interesting. The herds of cattle are perplexed because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. This, showed us, this shows us that sin infects, affects are the environment. There's a very real connection between the sin of humankind and judgment upon the earth itself. Romans 8 says, the whole creation is groaning, wailing. There's a personification giving to God's creation there. It's not saying, uh, it's personification. So it's not literally that the ground has a personality and so it mourns. But you understand the poetic imagery. There is a real suffering on the creation, and I like the word creation better than nature, don't you? The whole creation is suffering due to sin. But you know what? That'll change. In the new heaven and new earth, when God reigns, for example, even in the Old Testament this is spoken of, Isaiah 65, 25 says, The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. New heaven, new earth, the creation is restored, renewed, better than ever. No longer is our sin destroying what's around us. But the first thing is not to save the creation we're messing up, but we need to be saved from our sin and from the destruction and the judgment of God Himself. So what does Joel say, verse 19? To you, O Yahweh, I call, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness and flame has burned all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field pant for you because the water brooks are dried up. And fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. It's almost like this. The people are acting like the dumb beasts. Even when God is giving them these warning judgments. Not longing for God. Not calling out to Him. Just continuing on. But it's almost like Joel is saying, Even the dumb ox in the field get it. The beasts of the field pant for you? It shouldn't say the beasts of the field pant for water? It's a personification again of what God's people are supposed to be doing. So that's why the last point is there, not just calling for the Lord, calling to the Lord. In fact, later in this book, Joel will say, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's quoted in the New Testament. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I don't know about from every temporal judgment, but you'll most certainly be saved from the eternal judgment that is God's wrath in a place that we often refer to as hell. You will be saved if you call on the name of the Lord. But first, you have to long for the Lord. If your reason for calling on the Lord is just to get out of jail free card type stuff, it won't work. It won't be permanent, God knows. It's not gonna work. Just like these beasts pant, they long for God, so it seems, the prophet is saying. We must first long for Him. And again, how do you do that? If all this is gobbledygook, if you have no interest, if you even hearing about this kind of God makes you more angry at Him, how do you start to long for Him? Again, it's a supernatural act that must take place in your heart that you cannot conjure up. That's why we don't turn lights down low and play 20 stanzas of just as am to try to bend your will to get you to come because we know that is not going to do it. It's got to be in here, and it's got to be the Holy Spirit working in here to change the disposition of the human. How do you do that? You call out to the Lord. God, I don't long for you. Help me to long for you. If you're the unbeliever, ask that you could long for him and pant for him as a beast would water. 
that kind of strong desire. If you're a believer and all this repentance stuff just sounds too heavy, you can't take it so serious, pray. Dear Lord, help us, all of us. There's, there's probably no Christian in here that has the kind of strong desire for repentance in here. Who, this is not fun. Don't eat. Don't sleep. Wear grimy clothes. Cry loud in front of other people. Who wants to do that? God, help us. That kind of humbling can only come from the Lord. So, that's why I think this is a fitting place for this book, for us, to close, is to be asking God for that, is to be going to Him in prayer, is to be saying, give us the desire to long for you, O Lord, when we cry to you. That's right.